Uh, hello and welcome once again to this uh, episode uh, on News Click, uh, the series that we are running on uh, the Delhi Master Plan 2041. And uh, you know, today we have Mukta Naik, who is a fellow with the Center for Policy Research and also part of uh, uh, the MABI Delhi campaign. Actually, uh, the organization, I would say, uh, not just an organization, but you know, group of uh, many uh, organizations and individuals that is spearheading this campaign for a more participatory uh, uh, kind of uh, role for the for the master plan. So welcome, Mukta. And uh, uh, just for our viewers, I mean, just to recapitulate what we've been doing, we have actually tried to traverse the history of uh, the master plans right from 1961, even prior to that. Uh, and uh, then we've touched upon the social exclusion part. We've also touched upon mobility and also the general trajectory of the master plan, uh, especially post 90s. I mean, where, you know, the earlier master plans used to speak about, hey, we decided this, but we couldn't achieve. Okay, so let's let's again try to do something. But this, we are told, is more of a framework. And Mukta, with Mukta, we are going to discuss, I think, something which is very essential, uh, in fact, quintessential for uh, for the habitat. I mean, I mean, for, for the people to live in the cities. And we've seen how in just 24 hours when the lockdown was announced, people couldn't stay. I mean, they just started moving back. One of the reasons, apart from the livelihoods that they lost, was actually the habitat. They didn't have places to stay. So, uh, Mukta, I, th I think you're the best person to uh, talk uh, to us on you know, what does the master plan offer? Does it offer at all? And what are uh, uh, what 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 are the um, default lines? And you know, what are the gaps that sh that should have been addressed? So, straight, I think over to you, please. Go ahead. So, thank you so much, uh, Tikinderji and News Click, for the opportunity to talk about perhaps one of my favorite subjects on earth, uh, not because uh, I've done research and I want to sort of blow my own horn, but because uh, I think uh, shelter and habitat issues have been pressing issues the world over and the fault lines have appeared the world over during the pandemic, especially if you think about the kind of uh, agitation that's been happening around rent uh, you know, uh, where tenants are, are being evicted, tenants are not being able to pay because they've lost their jobs. And those those uh, uh, conversations, global conversations are reflected in the Indian context in interesting ways because we have such a high level of both work informality as well as housing informality. Because there are many people who are uh, unorganized sector mein kaam karte hain aur kachi bastiyon mein ya unplanned areas mein rehte hain to shayad unki ye jo livelihood aur housing ki issues combine ho jate hain aur problem aur zyada badh jati hai so that's the kind of situation context uh, that we are uh, sort of entering in with a very top down instrument like the master plan it's top down by design it, so that's the that's sort of the tension that we are working with here. So yeah, go ahead, Mukta. I mean, I mean fantastic. I mean, you brought in. I mean, I'm glad that um, for the first time hearing this housing informality also. I've been also talking about for, for informality in the uh, the workplaces. So please go ahead. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, what what, do, what is it that the two, 2041 offer? But I mean, the, maybe later I would like to ask you this question once you finish finished off your uh, uh, your presentation that you know this working informality has actually uh, also uh, given a, a kind of mirror to the to the to the top down planning process that hey you couldn't construct but we have done it for ourselves okay so so i mean how do you take it but later maybe maybe oh, absolutely maybe. i think i can bring that that comment of yours into the conversation so this is so, so like i said the master plan i'm trained as an urban planner so urban planners are trained in a very technocratic way they are to i mean they're trained to see the map of a city and sort of uh, block areas of the city into various zones so that's what a master plan a traditional land use plan does and that's what's been the trajectory as uh, has been explained in earlier episodes um you know in in delhi especially where the delhi development authority basically assigns land use zones to various parts of the city. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the government uh, has been sort of responsible for the supply of affordable housing for many, many decades. And it kept falling back 
on the targets that it set for itself. So over decades, we've had a situation where people, working class people who either come into the city or have been living in the city for very, very long, have had to make their own housing, just echoing what you just said. Um, so they have made occupied land. It could be public land in the case of Delhi. It's a complex, uh, you know, sort of landscape of land ownership itself, because there are many, many public agencies owning land. It's not just the DDA, it's the Delhi government, it's the railways, it's PSUs, it's many different army, you know, the cantonment, for instance, so forest land, so many different kind of public agencies own the land into which slums have uh, come up. Also unauthorized colonies, which is a big, big part of Delhi's housing landscape. And this is these have come up not so much because they have illegally occupied government land, but uh, because they have built housing in a place which was not designated for housing. So at the time that they came up, the land was agricultural and somebody plotted it and built housing on it. So there are many. And then there is a third type of sort of unplanned area, which is the Laldora area. Uh, where which are urban villages, um, the city developed and the Abadi areas of the villages um, remained in a um, sort of neglected state as the agricultural land were urbanized, acquired and sort of converted into the Delhi that we know today. So you see the Munirkas and the Shapur Jats of the world coming up in 21st century Delhi. These areas, the Jugi Jopi clusters, the unauthorized colonies, the Abadi areas in the Laldora areas actually supply the majority of affordable housing, whether ownership or rental in the city. And that's the reality that the plan is now coming into. So they have this situation where you're making a plan for a city where much of the land is already developed, whether planned, unplanned, legal, illegal. Usme log reh rahe hai. Zameen already occupied hai. People are already living in those places. And now you have the not enviable job of making a plan. So it's not empty land, just me aapko rang bharne hai. It's occupied land. So that's what the master plan is dealing with. So there are two paths when we come to the housing uh, uh, issue. Please, please, yeah, go ahead. The master plan. One is uh, the use of the new housing. So the use of what is imagined as vacant land for housing. And this, this demand is largely envisaged to be supplied from what the plan is terming land pooling areas. So these are areas to the north and west of the city. If you look at the land use plan, you'll see sort of a belt uh, to the north and west of the city, um, which is envisaged as being to be land pooled in a policy via a policy that was already developed before the master plan came into being. So the master plan is riding on this land pooling policy. Now, this policy ke tehet, imagination ye hai ki log apni land ko uh, or developers or other type of on owners ke saath milke ek consortium banayenge aur fir consortium us land ko develop karega so this consortium is supposed to develop the land and how and what the norms would be for development that has been specified in the master plan now so the master plan envisages about half of the demand for housing to come from these land pooling areas so they've said that about 34.5 lakhs is what they've estimated as housing demand in the city. I'd like to point out that this estimate is based on 2011 census numbers. So unlike previous master plans, they are not projecting to say that 2041 may population. Okay, so they're not projecting a 2041 population. They've said that we have done it for 2011 and we will revise as we go on. So as of now, these 34.5 lakh units are to be built, of which roughly half are going to come from land pooling areas. That's yeah, in, fa in fact, this is one of the most tom tom uh, scheme by, I remember the, the DDA, why she a person some time back, actually claiming that, look, look this, is, this is going to be kind of an alternative. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, land pooling as an, I think as an idea has now come, it's a really f fascinating policy makers because the land acquisition has been such a roadblock for any form of infrastructure development in this country. So the idea that landowners will voluntarily partner, uh, you know, with this, with, with infrastructure development is a very seductive idea, but the practical realities is a totally different thing. The scheme. Okay. So what are the practical realities? Yeah, what are yeah. You know, because Mukta, why, why I'm so so concerned about this, I mean, or rather eager to know, 
because I have spoken to many of these people who are going to pool their land and they are really fascinated with the idea, some of them. They say, okay, abhi humare wahan rasta nahi tha, aisa tha, abhi kam se kam hume appreciate land appreciation ho jayegi. But then another contradiction that gets proved is with the, the houses that are going to come up on this land, would that cater to, you know, the, the working people who are flooding the city? Yeah. I mean, how do you look at that? So, so both, both aspects, yeah. And that's, I think, uh, there's a little bit of a clue in the master plan there because 15% um, of the additional FAR has been given for EWS housing in new areas where housing is coming up. The plan itself flags that the Delhi Economic Survey says 85% of the housing demand is for affordable housing. So if we assume that affordable housing is low income and EWS segments of housing, EWS ko expand bhi kar dete hai. Let's say it's EWS and low income. And you are only giving 15% of the FAR as mandatory for EWS. You have a huge gap right there. So, um, you know, I'm, I think the master plan needs to break this 34.5 lakhs down and say ki is 34.5 lakh mein how many are going to be for AWS, LIG, MIG, HIG segment. Some indication of this would be really useful uh, going forward. Um, I won't get into the complications with the land pooling policy per se. We know these are very complex areas. I'll just say this much that, uh, you know, there are many kinds of players there where the so-called rural villages have kinship networks with urban villages who have already experienced development over these many decades. So they understand how these processes work. They don't trust the state to give them the fairest deal. They may not have the power, uh, the ability to negotiate with large developers. Uh, there is a lot of inequality within these urban villages in terms of, uh, you know, larger land owning and smaller land owning. So there's all of these fragmented kind of complexities, which a policy like land pooling doesn't really address. So uh, insecurity, hai, uncertainty, hai, uh, ek promise, bhi hai, par wo promise kaise achieve hoga, ye unclear. Hai. And the other thing is the land pooling policy itself has gone through multiple revisions. Ah, Mukta, so I think there's a very interesting thing that you pointed out that the contradiction or, you know, kind of different layers that, that exist in this whole process of land pooling. Uh, well, all that uh, said and done, but I think what is also important is that earlier what the DDA used to do, like, for, exa for example, they used to, uh, you know, do this process of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of constructing houses, uh, you know, uh, I mean, and and then 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 handing it over to the EWS sections. But don't you think that that activity has been abdicated? I mean, that responsibility kind of stuff has been completely abdicated now, left to. I mean, it's sheer market forces. Don't you think so? I mean, it's something like that. And if Absolutely. that is so, if and if that is so, what should be the alternative? I mean, what is it that we are looking at? Right. Right. So I think, yes, uh, it's, it's sort of tilted to the other side. And um, we know that from the experience, and this is not new in India. I mean, we have been seeing that the housing, the national housing policy moved into this role of facilitator instead of provider of housing decades ago, I mean, in the 2000s. And we've seen how it's played out through India, where the gap between the supply and demand for the affordable housing sector, and when I say affordable, I'm not talking about 30 lakhs per unit. When I say affordable, I'm talking about people, the poor who need, who need homes. The gap between the demand and supply there in the formal sector, in, the form, in terms of formal supply, has only increased over time. So yes, I think, uh, I, I mean, to, to say that the DDA should be building uh, homes for the poor is also something that I'm wary of because it wasn't very successful in doing so when it was supposed to be doing it. So where are we right now? You know, so I think there is some mid path uh, that, that we need to uh, follow. In the case of Delhi, there is actually a lot of public land that is held by a host of different kinds of public agencies. So I think there is an opportunity there to take a mid path where, yes, you have your reservations. Maybe you can increase the 15 percent reservation that private developers are making to a 20 or a 25 if you if you can push that a little bit, but also complement by making public lands available and incentivizing public agencies to 
use that land towards housing that's something that uh, you know there's been a lot of hesitation around doing that uh, uh, which 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 the maybe delhi campaign uh, and and at I'd say there that this is not an opinion of mine, but because the campaign has spent uh, three years uh, sort of talking to groups, working working class groups, unions, collectives, basti dwellers associations across the city, this is something we can say with some confidence that that sort of land reservation and commitment is required. Uh, to give you an example, uh, there is a mandatory reservation of ten percent land required for green areas in the master plan. and the master plan says you need to reserve it you need to and you need to hand this over to the dda so something similar needs to be done because without that so there has to be a co- basically a collaboration where if whoever is developing it actually de- earmarks land and either it hands it over to a public agency to develop or there are norms for a public private uh, you know form of development other other thing is that public land is actually brought into utilization and then the actual project can be developed through multiple modes so i think the idea that there will be private sector investment is here to stay to say that everything will be done by the government just means that it will never happen so we need to find something which is workable but where the government definitely put something of value on the table i don't think it's tenable for the government to be sitting on land in a city where it's very clear that poor people do not have adequate shelter it's the capital city that's the least that we can do for you know like you said earlier people who built the city and who are running it on a day to day basis i think uh, 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 probably the last question but if i mean so concretely uh, uh, as you pointed out the master plan offers more of a facilitator role i mean you know land pooling and all and we don't but 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 the master plan also speaks about tod I mean, you know transit oriented development and tod is not just mobility it is also housing you know the the kind of housing that it's uh, it, it 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 has elaborated and of course it's brought in some of the international experiences which are not re- like really very vibrant uh, so the point is that uh, i mean what is it that 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 we are heading for i mean even if it is a tod how successful that's a question that's another part but the point is then again it is for the middle class or the upper, it's, it's it, it doesn't include as you pointed out 85% of the housing demand comes for the weaker sections and yeah. and and another one i mean the last one you know many of the many of the migrants especially who come to the cities do not even want houses they want some rent, uh, some either rental housing or labor hostels so how does the 2041 master plan deal with this subject because we have two successful examples we have an example of kerala and also of simla you know where labor hostels are are pretty good i mean, I mean and then simla is i mean dates back to more than 100 years yeah so i mean how do you look at both these aspects yeah i'll, I'll actually take the second question first uh, the the plan actually uh, does make a departure from previous plans in giving rental housing adequate sort of importance it's not very clear on how and what and how much but there is definitely a tilt towards providing more rentals uh, so there's adi- there's a lot of ra- there's land reservation in industrial areas planned industrial areas uh, for worker housing there's also sort of uh, language in terms of working women's hostels labor hostels so these things have been mentioned in the plan and that's something that we should appreciate um in terms of rentals there's been i just want to bring in one other major shift that the plan has made it has brought in this word regeneration across the board note that they are not saying redevelopment they are not saying renewal which are loaded terms because historically they've been used in india in particular ways they're using this new term called regeneration um and they are imagining that uh, parts of the city that are dense crowded have multiple problems can now be regenerated either through amalgamating plots or through you know rwa is demarcating their areas and coming up with new plans so again there is a role here for investment for private sector to come in for all of that to happen and there's also an as is mode where renew regeneration means just improvement of facilities but it is not kind of you know neighborhood neighborhood committee is developing that plan it's not like that uh, it is 
I mean, the the neighborhood committees are very much at the forefront. Of course, the processes have not been outlined in the plan, but if we see how the trajectory has been, that's the imagination. Uh, and uh, you know, the unauthorized colonies conversation in Delhi is very interesting because it's a very political conversation. It's been an electoral issue for decades in the city, and in two thousand nineteen, there's a regularization act that the government has, the central government has brought in, which they've been trying to push with. not the best uptake for the last couple of years so the master plan actually comes in endorsing that sort of uh, sort of pathway of development but to come to your point on rentals they're also saying that these are areas where a lot of rental housing can be created when the re- regeneration happens so the imagination is jab regeneration hoga tab rental housing create hoga aur fir you know uh, so so there's and also then there is the Uh, affordable rental housing complexes scheme the public rental housing route which is also mentioned in the plan so two avenues of rental creation have been mentioned there's a third uh, sort of new um, typology of housing called small format housing which is 60 uh, square square meters and below um it's not very clear whether this is affordable or whether it's 60 just 60 square format. meters 60 meters square you're saying 60 meters square is not small yeah, yeah under or below <laughs> yeah, we've so been offering 35 meters square houses too that's true i think they were they, that, that's been a lot of push back on 25 square meters also so yeah. i think that so, but yeah. there, there's no clarity that this is affordable housing but there is a push to 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 sort of urge uh, everyone to make housing that is more accessible to a larger uh, cross section of people and i think we should also acknowledge that middle income housing is also a problem in the city Uh, so you know students who are getting into first jobs um uh, even basti dwellers who are trying to upgrade in uh, you, you know they move to unauthorized colonies when they can afford it so there's a housing trajectory uh, that we also need to think of intergenerational housing trajectory in, in delhi i'd also say that you know as somebody who studies cities and migration uh, delhi uh, contrary to what we think is not a city which is overrun by migrants anymore the rates of migration into delhi have actually been falling yes we have a lot of floating labor like you mentioned before a lot of construction workers daily wage labor who come work in the city and then may go and work elsewhere in a few months they not looking to make cities their home so they need a different kind of housing and here i'd like to also bring in the idea of sh- shelters where also i think the plan can do a little bit more to recognize shelters as actually a legitimate form of housing for the working poor who are only in the city for a few months yeah i remember i mean i because i was uh... a guide to you know the uh, final year spa students and one of the projects that i was guiding on was uh, uh, homeless shelters and i was amazed that 95% of the people who were staying in these home in one of the homeless shelters were actually working class people they were not beggars <laughs> so so they they were working either here or there so i mean they couldn't afford housing that's why they they were so yeah you, what you're saying is absolutely, absolutely correct so what is the ladder i mean if i if i would come here and i work and are uh, one of my colleagues uh, who's done a lot of research on homelessness in delhi actually found that many of them had been in delhi for years together while others were passing through you know there were there were a lot who came to delhi then they went to saharanpur for three months work there then they came back to delhi for three months so there is this mobility that we have to factor in and recognize that some forms of housing we will have to cater for this Uh, segment but other forms of housing we will have to imagine that people who are thinking that their children and their grandchildren are also going to stay in delhi require to be able to own homes over a period of time where is that avenue for ownership which is legal and planned so i'm bringing the question of tenure into play here because the master plan doesn't really engage with the question it sticks to its mandate of land use allocations but it it needs to at some point of time i know that it's not its mandate but unless these two mandates of tenure and space allocation come together we can't solve this problem of of housing uh, for, for for the people who need um, you know affordable housing in the city ownership of affordable housing just last one because that actually uh, really provoked me to another another question you know Uh, because uh, we can understand i mean m- uh, most of the uh, of the jargon that we find in the uh, 2041 master plan is you know new industries are going to come and then through that through through i mean with the engagement like uh, you know then we we can uh, we can expect some rental housing also i mean part being mandatorily uh, discussed or decided but 
I mean, we've seen, I mean, industries are hardly coming, I mean, you know, in the city, in the city centers or even in, in some of the, so we don't expect, I, apart from some of the hospitality or maybe, maybe some, but we, we do not have the time frame and when, when is that going to happen. So, I mean, does the master plan not think about, I mean, or, or what, what is your take on it? You know, that some, some kind of figure, maybe it, it is too utopian to decide, I mean, the, the, this number, we should have rental housing. And if not, I mean, we have so many uh, buildings uh, I mean, that have been constructed by private builders. Take them over and then, you know, some kind of dialogue. You you go to Noida and you find I mean, the huge blocks that are lying empty. I mean, there, there are no buyers for that. So don't you think that kind of dialogue should also be perhaps not part of the master plan, but kind of engagement? I mean, there are houses there already been constructed, but there are no buyers. No, yeah, I think uh, that the role for the master plan to correct uh, sort of historic wrongs in terms of uh, decisions is limited. And that falls into other uh, sort of jurisdictional spaces like the RERA, etc. Uh, like I said, the master plan sticks to its mandate, doesn't really try to engage with and perhaps can't engage with these other things. And that's a failure, a governance, a larger governance failure that we need to talk about. Like, how does the master plan actually dovetail with everything else that's regulation and that makes us its city or what it is but coming back to the point of industry uh, it's the master plan actually very clearly in its vision seems to want to move away from industry as manufacturing to industry as high tech and knowledge and hospital i mean services basically uh, so this itself i think if we look at it from the perspective of the working class is something that needs to be talked about a little bit more uh, because we've had, uh, you know, moves in the past to move industrial areas, you know, pollution has constantly been used as a, I mean, it's all, always been a conversation, but um, uh, manuf why is it that manuf removing manufacturing from the city is the utopian dream? And and I'm, I'm bringing this uh, you know, to the front, because this is, this is, this is not, we're not talking Singapore, we're not talking Dubai, we're not talking a city in the global north, we're talking about cities in the, in the global south, which require to create opportunities for people who are working class, who are less who educated, who have different set of skills, and cannot aspire for white collar work immediately, I mean, maybe three generations down the line. Second, what about the linkages with trade? Delhi is a trading city. People in Delhi, what is it that they do for a living? They run wholesale businesses. They run retail businesses. They are retailing, uh, you know, hardware and lights and uh, machine components. How do you divorce this from the reality of, I mean, how do you have a vision of the city, of the future that is divorced from this everyday reality of the city? So these are questions that have been perturbing me about the master plan. That in 20 years, what has been historically built over hundreds of years how do you imagine that in 20 years it will turn into this clean yeah. tech knowledge space? Yes. so that's a question and and if, if we just keep raising that question consistently and make space for the realities of the city and say let's plan let's fix the problems that exist whatever is going to happen in the future will happen as things move on but so that's a big sort of question mark that I would like to put. I agree. And, uh, you know, just, just to give a reference to that, I mean, if you go by the first urban commission, I mean, it the gist of the urban commission is that cities have to be manufacturing hubs. So, you know, that's how the city, the, the whole idea of uh, of city development comes. Well, we seem very uncomfortable with that idea today. We seem to imagine yeah. that everything will become this knowledge, uh, you know, very clean, sanitized, smart city space and no, nothing against smart nothing against clean but uh, you know you have to imagine that your workers are going to live in a clean well organized environment in addition to knowledge workers who will come i mean you can't imagine a city where there are only going to be tech uh, you know folks who's going to drive you know clean their cars who's going to walk their dogs i mean this, this is a question we've always you know put, put forth so yeah so absolutely and the last thing i mean uh, you know, I think one month extension is is what what the DDA has allowed to raise objections, and and Duno in one of the first, I mean, not one of the first episodes pointed out that in 1961 there used to be a monadi. You know, a drummer used to go beat the drum and say, "Ke dekhi master plan ban raha hai Delhi ka bhai, apni objection de do." Abhi to chupa rahe hain, matlab bahut mushkil se itna bhi ladke ho rahe hain. 
So, and you, since you are part of the campaign, so what do you think should be done? Because, uh, you know, there were many people who said, why don't you create an alternative uh, kind of master plan? I mean, but you know, you require, I mean, this is, this is a four years exercise. And it's so difficult, I mean, to come up with an alternative kind of stuff. But do you think there should be some kind of white paper or, or maybe, I mean, what do you propose as part of uh, civil society group uh, for engaging people? So that more and more people come up. At least, what is our role? Where is our role? You've given me, you've given me a very good plug to talk about it in Delhi. So, at this time, because we got extra days in Delhi, this window that we have got, uh, which DDA, I think, was very gracious in recognizing that there is a short shortcoming in terms of engagement, is actually being used by the campaign to do Basti meetings, online, offline, in Bastis, um, uh, you know, 10 people, 12 people at a time. And you can imagine in COVID, because we can't have a large public meeting, it's that many more meetings that we need to do. But that's being done, uh, where, uh, you know, they, they're cons- and the thing is that the campaign has engaged with these bastis for the last three years and they're already, the members of the campaign are already organizations who are embedded in these locations. So they know what the problems are. So they're going back saying, Aapke jo mudde hai, your problems, this is what the plan is saying about those issues. What do you think? And then, uh, you know, some of us have done work in terms of sort of putting together a dump of a large number of objections, suggestions, directions. But depending on what those communities think, somebody helps them articulate it in simple terms and then they are sitting and filing it and somebody is helping to sit and file it. So this is what the campaign is doing. It would have been ideal if DDA had been doing this. (laughs) That's really, that's really, I think, and and, and even now, I mean, I would use this forum to invite the DDA and the NIUA. Come be part of our community meetings. I think people need to see that the makers of the plan are interested in the issues that the people face in the city. It's a, it's, a, it's a question of trust. It's a question of feeling that this is not a top-down plan that we are involved. So that's an opportunity that you ha- that they have and they should take it. Uh, public meetings that the DDA organized were great, but as we all know, there is a digital divide. Public meetings are not oh, online. Public oh, webinars. Meetings. Yeah, that's so webinars. webinars are not enough. They're not even public meetings. We've, we have been assured that you know once the objections and suggestions are filed, there will be more sort of meetings to discuss once you know once they organize what comes in through this process um but a lot more engagement can happen i'm appalled that in this city even even middle class people they don't know what the plan is and how it Absolutely. you know it's, yeah, it's cool. going to impact their lives going forward and that's not okay especially in a capital city which has so much to offer i mean from your background has uh, jama masjid on it you know it it has you know heritage it has you know uh, this 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 huge expanse of long history of different kinds of cities being built here and people don't seem to have that sense of the city so I mean there was so much opportunity to to engage which which the plan could have uh, taken up I think people in Delhi feel for their city there is a lot of feeling for Delhi uh, which was untapped in terms of participatory processes thank you Mukta for speaking to us and uh, yeah I think that's very very important I mean uh, uh, as far as uh, engagement with people is concerned all the best for maybe the league campaign Thank you so much.